if we don't change capitalism to be more caring and conscious, it's going to kill us. And the world will spit us out like a watermelon seed and keep on going. Uh, they'll be better off without the human species until we clean up our act. I mean, the rest of the world creatures and uh, systems. So I work every day to try and do my part to change capitalism to something that's more humane and more sustainable. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label that distinguishes soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock. You just heard some thoughts about capitalism from today's guest, Kat Taylor. She's a banker and philanthropist focused on social and environmental justice and deep systems change. Before we hear more from Kat, I want to ask you to take a moment today to leave a rating and review of our podcast. We're working hard every day to reach more people, and that small action on your part can make a big difference for our movement. Now let's get back to the conversation between my co-director, Dave Chapman, and green banker, Kat Taylor. Hello, and welcome to The Real Organic Podcast, and I am talking today with Kat Taylor. Hello, Kat. It's a, it's a real privilege to talk with you. I'm so glad that we were able to get this together. Kat is the co-founder of Beneficial State Bank and also of Tomcat Ranch um, with her husband and partner, Tom Steyer. You are a very engaged social and climate activist. So, Thanks. Welcome. Thank you, Dave. This is a great opportunity. Thanks for inviting me. Sure. So, you, you know, in the, in the symposium, you really represent a unique uh, triad of perspectives. Uh, we have some people who are connected to agriculture and also to climate activism, but you're the only one who brings in banking, which I actually think is important, right? So can we talk about how you decided to become a banker? Because I don't think that's exactly where you started. You didn't go to college going, I want to be a banker. Yeah, <laughs> a, a little bit I did. But uh, yes, I think uh, banking is super important. As Bill McKibben entitled one of his latest articles, finance is the oxygen burning down the world. Um, because finance is, by my calculations, the largest industry in the world. It drives societal outcomes, not just economic ones. Um and we're finding out, as Martin Luther King said, that all the human and civil rights victories are somewhat hollow if we don't also have economic fairness and equity. So um, I think probably my motivation is stems in part from my earliest memory, which was of the so-called civil rights funerals. That's what I call them. Um, the funerals of JFK, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, even Malcolm X, um, because I was five years old at the first one, and I had an innate sense that something was terribly wrong in our country um, from the somberness of the adults uh, and then from learning imperfectly, I might add, in my public education um, no slam on public education. I just don't think we've taught the history of our country, honestly. But I did get it that slavery and native genocide, persecution of immigrants and refugees, less than personhood for women, degradation of our ecological commons was really, those were the sins of our origin. And until we fix those, the world would not be right, particularly with America's leadership in the world. So while I didn't understand how a white girl of privilege would end up helping the civil rights movement, I was looking for the opportunity and I recognized at the formation of the great socially responsible banks, those would be South Shore Bank, Grameen Bank, uh, Self-Help Credit Union, et cetera, in the 70s, that um, banking was a really important lever and um, determinant of uh, our social economic, racial, and environmental uh, agenda. Okay, so uh, I have heard you give a number of talks to bankers, so here's your chance to talk to a bunch of farmers and, uh, and eaters, but, but you know, so tell, tell an uneducated guy, why is banking important? Yeah, so 
I'm one of those uneducated guys as well because I'm a naive. I didn't spend my whole career in banking. My family was in banking, so I had a couple summers exposure to it, but I'm approaching this as a lay person as well. So to break down why banking is important and what it's actually supposed to do, I think about it in terms of it being the original and most powerful form of crowdfunding, not that a specific deposit funds a specific loan, but all deposits fund a lending practice, and that lending practice really matters. Uh, And by all rights, I think depositors should get to let their money fund a lending practice that they can be proud of. So we've been trying to awaken the agency and accountability of bank customers. That would be agency meaning choice, that you do have choice. You don't have to bank with a bank that's disregarding your basic values. And you have accountability or responsibility because you're uh, inevitably associated with the outcomes of that lending practice if you allow your deposits to fuel it. So you're suggesting that that banks are different and that some banks actually can have a very positive uh, effect on on society and some banks actually can have a negative impact on society. Did I get that right? Yes. So if you think about it, if your bank is uh, lending into fossil fuels, private prisons, and predatory lending, you're associated with that and likely you don't agree with those outcomes because it's accelerating climate change It's implicated in mass incarceration, especially of black Americans, uh, and it's bilking people out of their money through uh, debt trap and sneaky banking products um, or non-banking products because a lot of payday lending is done by non-bank institutions. And I'm curious, you're, you're working on change. You're working on changing these large systemic forces, how much of that do you see as being regulatory reform and how much of that do you see as being, um, you know, uh, consumer uprising, saying, instead of going to this bank, I'm going to go to the bank that shares my values. So that's a little bit different from saying, I'm going to write my congressperson. And I, I, I don't think that the, you know, that the regulatory reform reform works very well until we get the the uh, voter uprising. But I'm just curious, do you feel that your efforts are focused more on one than the other? Um, so we thank you because you just for, sort of uh, foreshadowed what our theory of change is and how we go about trying to affect the change. And it's a threefold strategy, two of which you just named. So we are working with movement builders to get consumers to vote with their money So to take their money out of banks that are disrespecting their values and crashing our planet and being racially and gender unjust and to move it to an institution that's respecting their values. So that's the kind of consumer movement. You've seen evidence of that, for instance, in the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. The leaders of that uh, movement recognized early that banks were Uh, culpable in the financing of the pipeline. And so they encouraged depositors to move their money and they moved it um, in the millions of dollars. um, I think something like $80 million left in the first four weeks. That's still tiny in comparison to the size of the banking industry. At any point in time, there's something like 12 or 13 trillion dollars of deposits in the American banking system alone. So uh, it's quite incremental, but it's symbolic and it's important in terms of motivating consumers who actually have the power to vote with their money and make change. Then the second tactic is actually to work with other financial institutions and try to convince them that for enlightened self-interest, they should migrate to a banking model more like ours, which has a triple bottom line. We're mandated to achieve racial and social justice, environmental well-being, and financial sustainability. So we built a bank model that we have to prove can compete in the marketplace and be solvent and financially uh, resilient. Um, And because then we want banks to think, oh, we can bank like that and we should bank like that because of three things. They'll get more deposits because people will vote with their money and give them their deposits. 
They'll get more equity capital because if you think about divest, invest, we know uh, that movement to divest from fossil fuels, private prisons, et cetera. We know what we're getting out of. We have less clarity on what we can get into. And investing in a bank is really powerful for all the reasons I said. And if it's a bank with a triple bottom line, even better so that those kinds of banks can attract more low cost equity by doing that. And then the third thing that they want is human capital, deposit equity and human capital. Um, we get remarkable young people to work at the bank and the bank foundation that owns the bank when they would likely never work for a bank uh, that wasn't respecting their values. So having a competitive edge for human capital is really meaningful in any industry, but maybe especially banking. Sure, sure. So the things you're talking about are very uh, reminiscent for me of the issues we're dealing with in the Real Organic Project. And there is an ongoing discussion about are we trying to reform the USDA, the National Organic Program, or are we trying to create an alternative? And I, I, I have taken the position that, that we have to create an alternative in order to reform it, that, that there needs to be a movement before, before there's reform. We can't expect the reform to come first when it's in opposition to big corporate interests. It just isn't going to work unless there's a lot of people. I'm curious... Um, you talk about you know people moving eighty million dollars and that that's not a big deal on one level, but on another level, I can imagine that banks might have been quite concerned not by the loss of the eighty million dollars, but by the tipping point, you know the the spark that this might be. I'm sure that there was a lot of attention paid to that. Uh, is that right? Do you think? I'm not sure it's, uh, I can um, vouch that the whole industry took a look at that and, you know, sat up and thought, oh, we need to pay attention to this because it could represent a movement that sullies our reputation at the, at a minimum or maybe even threatens our business model. But I did note that Bank of the West shortly after that made a pledge to pay all their workers at least $15 an hour. And that's contrasted with a third of the tellers in the banking industry needing to rely on public support because they can't live on the wages they're paid. Uh, yeah. And then Bank of the West also said they would divest from fossil fuels on a, I think, five-year time frame. frame. So it, that was maybe influenced by Dakota Access Pipeline and other mass movements where they thought the market opportunity is moving and I need to move the business model with it. Do you think that success, when you imagine what you're doing, is uh, there's a term I heard from Meg Wheatley called "islands of sanity." I can't remember. If, have you used that term? No, no. Oh, it's, it's a wonderful great. expression. Yeah. Um, and she's she's going. You know, she actually thinks well, things are going to get pretty bad, but we need to create islands of sanity, and um, in order to have something good grow out of what, what might be quite a lot of catastrophe. And I like the term. I think it's, it's good. Do you think that um, as you are creating, you are consciously working on creating islands of sanity, whatever you call them, do you think that that model will be taken up by the huge banks going and saying, oh, we need to change? Or do you think it will be smaller regional banks that might say there's an opportunity for us Let's let's change who we are in order to create a genuine alternative. Yeah. So I think we recognized early on that we're not we're not changing the behemoth institutions, the giant money center banks. They're a little bit locked in place like the dinosaurs. Um, so we're our focus is on regional banks who have more um, facility to change, more agility, if you will. Um, and I, I love that expression, islands of sanity. I had not even heard it before, but it reminds me of Dwayne Elgin, the futurist, uh, who talks about, I think it's the seven stages of awakening uh, about us creating a new human civilization that's much more deconcentrated, is local in its effect, even though it's globally connected. So I think a dis more distributed system is in the offing and is where we should go um, because it's 
it's more easy to be accountable if you have market can, you really understand the communities that you're serving and so on. And maybe those are mm. the islands that persist. To me, um, being on the verge of collapse, which sounds, oh my God, devastating and depressing, actually creates new opportunity sets, I believe. So Leonard Cohen said, look for the cracks, mm. that's, that's where the light gets in. I think yeah. that's true across the entire landscape of human activity right now. Um, and we should take advantage of those openings to make real change. Did you, did you uh, read or listen to uh, 1619, the New York Times series? Yes. Yeah. 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 It was really good, I thought. And I wished it went very, on and on and on. I know. I was like, that's it? You're going to stop there? It was, it was excellent. The first session for me was uh, so thought provoking about low road capitalism yeah, and that our capitalism in America really grew absolutely directly out of slavery. And the Northern banks were very involved in this, you know, that human, human slaves were con the highest um, asset in the American economy. Mm -hmm. And that as a result of that, our, our capitalism isn't very nice. It, it's not very concerned with the greater common good. But, and I've seen it suggested that, that Adam Smith would be very unhappy for his ideas to be uh, claimed by modern capitalism in America because he actually believed that this was to lift all people up. Yeah, Adam Smith didn't think the economy um, or markets are what create beneficial human civilization. He thinks that they're a tool along the way, a thought, and that it's actually our cultural and religious institutions that give us our value system. And then we're supposed to make the economy heal to our value system, which we have not done. We've allowed it to be the be all and end all to, you know, that it somehow is this um, immutable force that we're supposed to obey when in fact we're the, um, the we're the source of rules that it should obey. So, so do you think that we can grow a saner capitalism? Uh, yes, and I wouldn't be in banking if I didn't believe that was true. I take your premise as absolutely true that our version of capitalism, especially in, in America is based on colonialization and extractive, in the extreme, extractive of life, land, labor, everything. And the, the uh, economy was based on that and allowed us to um, sort of leapfrog the other major uh, countries of the world. Uh, and by the way, keep Africa down too, which could have been a mighty competitor in the world arena if we hadn't stolen all those human beings and um, and then colonized it after the war. Um, so before and after the war. But the, um, the uh, opportunities to change capitalism, I think are more real now than they have been in a long time. I have never agreed with Milton Friedman's proposition that the only responsibility of the corporation is to maximize shareholder value. I think that's complete poppycock, but that was taught in all American business schools, at least when I went to them in the early 80s. Um, I think it still persists, but there's challenges to what the role of the corporation is and, and more importantly, what the responsibilities of the corporation are. The um, I fancy regimes like the B corporations that take an affirmative commitment to meet many more values than just profit maximization and hold themselves responsible to a third party audit every other year to make sure that all of their practices are consistent with high road um, uh, employment, uh, environmental respect, uh, consumer safety and um all sorts of other values. Um, that's a voluntary regime, of course. And even though it's grown, I think the maybe 4,000 companies, once again, it's incremental. It's symbolic and it could uh, initiate a wave of, of consumer awareness about the corporations that they are willing to do business with. 
um, and maybe some regulatory moves to hold corporations responsible for their externalities, those harms that they foist um, outside of their corporate uh, boundaries. Um, I, I sound a little bit fantastical and naive, I would imagine, uh, but put it this way, if we don't change capitalism to be more caring and conscious, it's going to kill us. And the world will spit us out like a watermelon seed and keep on going. Uh, they'll be better off without the human species until we clean up our act. I mean, the rest of the world creatures and uh, systems. So I work every day to try and do my part to change capitalism to something that's more humane and more sustainable. Yeah, we got our work cut out for us as humans. We really do. So before we leave uh, this, I'd like to go to food. But before we do, you, you talk about uh, really participating in the new economy. So could you talk about that, please? What's the new economy? So the, the so-called definition that we use is that a new economy will be fully inclusive, racially and gender just, and environmentally restorative, not neutral, but actually repairing our ecological commons. Um, I'm in favor of reparations, so I think that has to be an element of it all. Um, and uh, in terms of inclusion, I think we have to be open to the possibility that brand new companies, much more tailored to unique customer need, will be part of that. Um, so we keep our eyes open in the banking industry for fintech disruption to see, is it a better value proposition for the consumer? So you said, we stand in this economy to get to the next. It's, it's wonderful. Could you explain that, Kat? So I, I believe we have to reform capitalism as opposed to scrap it and start with something else. I just don't believe that we will be able to start fresh with a blank canvas. Um, and there are elements of capitalism that are pretty good at doing efficiency, capital allocation, so on. It's just we haven't infused it with enough of our values and held it accountable to non-financial ends. So that's why I say we're you know, standing in a bad system that needs reform to get to a better system. Yeah, yeah. Your core values of Beneficial Bank, which I like because I consider them the core values of the Real Organic Project, trust, justice, empowerment, and you added creativity. So uh, that's right. You, you said without trust, your bank does not succeed. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Well, I mean, fundamentally, nobody will put their money with us if they don't trust us. Um, but I think that trust in our case goes beyond just safety and soundness and honesty. It goes, they're trusting us to build a better world. Then the justice, because we have just such an unjust economy and an un, a, a history filled with injustice that persists today. So I love this cartoon called The Real American Dream, where it shows an African-American young man starting out on a game board that has the most circuitous route with many, many pitfalls and assaults. Um, and he's on one starting line and on a parallel starting line is a white young man st looking at a straight path with no obstacles. So I don't believe we're seeking equality. I think we're seeking equity and that will require reparations, restoration, repair. Um, and that's um, what we should be doing uh, in our business activities as well. It's gotten to the place where the problems that we face for our survival, for our kids' survival, for our grandkids' survival, have to be dealt with on a broad social scale. We, we have to get governments to do better. It's not enough, as, as Al Gore said, that it's, it's, it's good to change the light bulbs. It's, it's even better to change the laws. Yeah. How do you think about that? Um, well, uh, my colleague Taj James at Full Spectrum Capital to often talks about buen vivir, or literally the good life. Um, and I, I, I wish I were more of a student of um, the contemplative arts, but I do know that when anyone suffers, we all suffer. So 
ranging from the just realistic self-interest that if we hand the world off as it is to our children and grandchildren, they will suffer and we will feel that, to the more existential, I can't be happy if there are people suffering in the world. I think both are really helpful motivators. And um, I just I just don't believe that any of us will have a good life until all of us have a good life. Right. Okay. So let, thank you. Let's, let's go to Tomcat Ranch. Um, it, it wasn't enough to start uh, a new vision of banking. You, you also <laughs> started a new vision of agriculture. Can you tell me how that happened? How did you get into that? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I don't have the ability to disconnect anything from anything else. Um, it's kind of an extreme version of systems approach. Um, but my husband has linear focus, just like unbelievable discipline to drive towards an outcome. So in a compromise, we agreed to focus, a word that I don't even have the right to use, uh, but anyway, focus on three big systems um, that are interconnected in their cycles and effect. So that was, we called them sort of kindergarten names, good food, good money, good energy, and we decided to put an operating entity at the heart of each so we would gain the insights of real actors in those systems, even though we're a little bit of a phony actor in, at Tomcat Ranch in that it's not a livelihood ranch. There's nobody trying to put food on the table based on the economic outcomes of Tomcat Ranch. It's a learning laboratory. Um, but at the heart of good money, of course, we put the bank and then uh, pretty rapidly after that two venture funds because... Banks aren't good at funding startups. The new economy will include a lot of startups. So we needed to be in the trying to disrupt the venture model as well in favor of impact. Um, and then at the, the heart of good energy, Tom spent a fair amount of time looking at both climate and the energy systems that we're dependent upon in our economy and really came up with the thought that we don't lack the scientific or business a knowledge to recognize we need to change. It's the political will that's lacking. So as you likely know, he went headfirst into politics, um, first with Next Gen America, the largest youth voter mobilization effort in recent history, uh, and then into need to impeach, to dislodge a, um, a leader in our country who is antithetical to any climate justice or uh, beneficial ends for all people, in our opinion, and then towards running for president to uh, make sure that the presidential um, race uh, conversation included race and climate and other issues that were being skipped over um, in the main. So at the heart of good food, we put Tomcat Ranch. It is a learning laboratory where we're trying to demonstrate the regenerative ranching practices that create healthy food, uh, resilient lands, um, uh, excuse me, uh, e uh, ecologically sound lands and resilient rural economies in a way that inspires others to action. Um, uh, so that's how we ended up starting Tomcat Ranch Educational Foundation. But I have to say, I was a naive, uh, inexperienced person going into the ag space as well, just like I was going into banking. Um, and we really thought about hard about what could be our value add uh, in food and agriculture uh, before we started that foundation and went into the cattle business. A lot of people think the cattle business is antithetical to good ecological outcomes. And it can be, especially in our opinion, when it is uh, dependent upon confined animal factory operations uh, and converting uh, natural lands to grazing. So we favor instead uh, using regenerative ranching to tend the grazing commons of the planet. That's one of the dominant coverages of the Earth's surface is grazing lands, grasslands, if you will. Um, but we want to do do that in a way that mimics nature, and that's what regenerative practice does. You don't have to actually eat the beef, but we need the e effect of ungulates, which cattle are one type of, on our grasslands in order to continue to build critical topsoils, resequester carbon, cherish water, 
create biodiversity above and below the ground, um, create potentially a healthy human um, product, human uh, food, and uh, treat animals with respect. So I think that this is an important thing, though, important conversation, which is using livestock as part of a solution to climate change instead of, for sure, the way it is done now. And I, I, I believe that it's true that Jonathan Safran Forrest said 99% of our meat, milk, and eggs come from CAFOs now in America. Yeah. So that's a, I, I, I mean, most people don't know what a CAFO is and they, you know, if you just said it's a concentrated animal feeding operation, they go, that doesn't sound so bad. But it is pretty bad, isn't it? And, um, and it's very bad in terms of its impact on the local, the local economy, you know, the local neighborhood community on, on climate. So it, it's a big deal um, that, that this is where, it's not that farmers are evil, it's where they're being pushed by economics. Uh, yeah, and that vertical integration. I was a vegetarian for 12 years and I had to, you know, get comfortable myself with raising animals to be harvested. So it was a convoluted path towards becoming a cattle rancher, but I still believe you don't actually have to harvest and eat animals to participate in a healthy livestock regime. And it is one of the tenets of regenerative agriculture, the five uh, pillars being um, minimal or no soil disturbance, the cultivation of long-rooted plants, the eschewing of off-farm inputs, especially chemical uh, pesticides and fertilizers, the encouragement of biodiversity above and below the ground, and the reintegration of livestock into row cropping regimes, which is the historic agricultural practice that maintains those healthy topsoils. We lose them at a very rapid clip and we build them back in a slow manner. So we have to keep those animals on the land in order to um, protect and rebuild our uh, ecological commons, the soils. Yeah. So all the things that you're describing, I would I would say are the uh, traditional meaning of organic. And, you know, that's real organic project exists because that is being lost. I mean, right now, the majority of uh, milk is coming from CAFO dairies that are certified as organic, which is, seems a contradiction. Yeah. The vast majority of eggs and poultry are coming from CAFOs that are certified as organic. And, you know, I got into the debate because of hydroponics, which I just was aware of because I sell into those markets. I'm like, well, I thought we already decided that this would not be called organic. And from there, I got into discovering that there was all this CAFO production, in my mind, being, being wrongly certified. And it's funny, I kind of came to the same place that you came, but from a very different perspective. And from there, I came into the impact of agriculture on climate and and starting to look at what's happening with the economy and um so uh, it, it ended up at the same punchline do you think and and one of the things i'd say is i see that regenerative agriculture has the same problem that organic agriculture has which is that large corporations are claiming it as their own and it's even easier because there's no legal definition of regenerative so you know, if somebody says we're taking a million acres regenerative and what they mean is we're spraying glyphosate on a million acres and it is what they mean. Yeah. Who's to say that that's not right? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of words that, that we need to clarify. And, and I think that, that what's important is to figure out how do we create a movement so consumers can support the agriculture they want to support. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think... You, uh, you're right, and I appreciate you having real in your name because it is hard to hold to authentic standards. Um, you know, there's plenty of also bare dirt organic farming, certified organic, but bare dirt is a violation of the regenerative principles. Um, and it should be because we lose their, therefore, soils to wind and erosion and we probably have compaction and don't absorb water well. And so it's really looking at it as a holistic system that has holistic practice and holistic outcomes. I don't know the answer to the dilemma that you pose, which is 
how do we make sure that these are real and consumers are getting the straight scoop? But it, possibly it lies, at least in part, in uh, third-party audited impacts, not just standards of production, but you know what is your water infiltration rate and what is your biodiversity and because you can't really fake those and um, maybe in judging the impacts we can force back to the practice more authenticity and um, ecological soundness yeah absolutely i mean some of the standards are actually pretty good they're just not enforced yeah so it's it's really they have I have to say, when when they passed the Organic Food Production Act, which was the law that that drew the USDA into all this, and it's a pretty good law. They they really, if you look at the language of it, it's good. And you would say, yes, I, I, that's the agriculture I want to support. Um, but you know what happens then is is a, a huge huge issue, huge discussion. Um, how, how things get enforced. I will say the good part of it is that the market has grown to exceed $50 billion a year. Yep. And that's just only for the good because that is 30, 40 million Americans choosing to buy organic in the store. Yeah. Because they want an alternative to chemical agriculture. Yeah. And they want everything that we want. So that's a wonderful thing. Now we just have to make sure that the trust that that they're giving is earned, you know, and that there's transparency. Yeah. yeah. I think the pandemic too has um, uh, inspired a bunch of people to worry more about the provenance of their food for, from a health standpoint. Um, and also uh, we're trying to write an article with Civil Eats about what the pandemic and economic shutdown has revealed are the pain points in the food system. And one of them, you know, starting at the very beginning, uh, giving viral and bacterial agents a homogenous, closely packed population uh, is really dangerous uh, from avian and swine flu to human beings in slaughterhouses, 3,700 strong, you know, one case of COVID and you have to shut down the whole place. Um, and so we've seen these frailties in the food system, and it's our chance now to address them, um, maybe just by having a more distributed system. Yeah. Yeah, people talk about the balance between efficiency and resiliency. And um, I, I don't believe that an, a non-resilient system can be efficient. Right. But I understand in the very short term, you can go, we can make a buck this way. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's also, you know, just so many unfair subsidies in the industrial system that um, occlude from us what the real economics are. So um, from farm insurance, uh, cro you know, crop insurance products, we actually just proposed two new crop insurance products that instead of rewarding um, applying the National Fertilizer Recommends, which is that long list of chemicals that you pour into the soils like they're a vessel, not a living system. Instead of that saying, we'll, how about if we ensure your crop yield if you follow six or more of the carbon farming practices under NRCS's regime, or you adopt integrated pest management instead of the use of chemicals, you know, we could change the incentives in the food system to our betterment as well. Yeah, yeah, very much. I think that. Do, can you can you talk more about that? I mean, I'm just I'm just interested in what those hidden uh, supports are for for sort of industrial CAFO uh, food production. Yeah. Well, so I'm not an expert, but I uh, take my lead from the Union of Concerned Scientists and other organizations like that that have studied. Um, and similar to the oil and gas industry, there have been a lot of federally sponsored subsidies. Um, and then other obstacles to what I would consider fair competition, like the imposition of market standards that make it very hard for small scale producers to participate. The, the um, you know, just large systems where uh, small and mid-sized producers who tend to be more oriented towards organic and um, regenerative practice can't participate in these massive systems 
like we work very hard with school districts. Um, school districts in California serve almost a billion meals every year. They're a huge, big buyer demand strategy for us. Um, and if we can encourage them to buy California local, we get to less preserved, less processed, more organic, and so on. But we're also working very hard to create resilient infrastructure so that small, smaller scale producers can participate um, and they're, they're not blocked out by sort of impossibly high minimums and things like that. Um, that might, you know, fly in the face of efficiency because, you know, picking up a half truckload twice is possibly way more efficient than picking up four pallets 30 times. Uh, but we forget to count all the benefits that come from that in terms of diversification and resiliency and higher quality foods and better educational readiness for our children. You know, we we don't make the problem big enough to see the biggest solution set. Okay, so let's talk about some of those benefits for a minute. Let's start with health. Um, diet has sort of transformed uh, America's health situation. I think that's fair to say that people are getting sick from different things than they used to get sick from. Um, now, non-communicable diseases are our major, major health threat that most Americans will face in their lives, not not the old communicable diseases. Yeah, yeah. So, and those seem to be pretty diet related. Totally. You know, the, yeah, so um, can you talk about that? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty well established that um, the industrial food system produces foods that are higher in salt, fat, and sugar, um, especially the bad kinds of fat, because we do have essential fatty acids that we need to get. Um, and those are uh, properties in food that can increase the risk of diabetes, of obesity, um, even of other um, uh, dangers like the use of glyphosate is now uh, in court cases firmly connected to a higher risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. So um, we are what we eat and we are what we eat eats. So we need to clean up the food supply chain so that when it, by the time it gets to us, it is real food that doesn't, that creates benefits in human health and doesn't cause harm. Yeah, that's actually, I think the name of Anne Bickley and David Montgomery's next book is You Are What You Ate Ate or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like looking at that chain. So are you... You, I assume you get to eat really good food from Tomcat Ranch. I do, and we even, in the pandemic, started growing some row crops so that we could contribute donated food to our communities. Um, so we, you can get a full meal at Tomcat Ranch now, not just beef. Um, and I want to recognize that a healthy, high-quality diet is right now considered a privilege, and it is because it costs more. And we have a real problem in this country of underpaying workers. So we have people who can't afford housing, can't afford the food that actually nourishes them, uh, and can't afford health care. And that's just um, unacceptable, and we have to change it. But we have to change both sides of the calculus, not just try to produce cheaper food, because often that just runs us right back into the industrial system where we aren't getting high-quality, nutritious food at all. Um, yeah. And... Honestly, the large employers in this country need to be held accountable for underpaying and underbenefiting their workers because that's a charge on society in general. Yeah, let me read something that Michael Pollan said. Uh, Michael's so good at this stuff. Uh, it is very hard to advance a reform agenda that would inevitably, as it should, raise the price of food. Food is not cheap. It's dishonestly priced because it assumes undocumented workers being exploited and it assumes animal abuse. Yep, and environmental degradation that we all pay for. Absolutely. Yeah, he said this enough years ago that, that he wasn't, I don't think he was even thinking of climate change at that point, which which is part of that whole equation, right? Yeah, absolutely. The true cost of food is um, not honestly uh, portrayed in the market. Um, and so we, one of the reasons we went into regenerative practice is the promise that it could help resequester carbon into our biggest carbon sink remaining, which is the soils, 
We've overstuffed the atmosphere and the oceans, so we have to put carbon back where it can do no harm. The ancient soils were estimated to be 11% comprised of carbon, durable soil carbon. Um, our current agricultural soils in the industrial system, I think, are less than 1.5%. The difference is in the air and in the oceans, and we need to put it back in the soils. Okay, so for people who are not farmers and uh, are not scientists, that's a, what you said. I completely agree with. Can we can we tease that apart a little? So, how did I know some of that carbon we mined and we drilled, but but a lot of that carbon was released through what I would call. Uh, uh, unfortunate agricultural practices. Yeah, right? for sure. A whole, a whole lot of tillage, a whole lot of uh, chemical nitrogen, and you know what we would call uh, uh, an agriculture that that burned the carbon out of the soil. So a lot of oxidation going on. So in order to get that carbon back in, could you talk about how that works? If you can explain that for somebody who's not a farmer. Sure. So once again, the layperson naive uh, view of this is as follows. So it's uh, not just that we mined carbon out of the soils and, and created practices that made it hard for it to go back, like compaction of soils. Soil carbon lives in crystalline soil structure. It's very hard to get um, water or carbon back into soils that are compacted to be dense. So there were practices that you mentioned and that I mentioned that uh, pulled carbon out of the soil, but we also stopped doing the things that historically and naturally put carbon into the soil, mostly through photosynthesis and the grazing of, of, the, of plants by ungulates. So I like to describe it in terms of the Serengeti. The great breadbaskets of the world are the uh, historic grazing corridors, the Serengeti, the Great Plains, the Yukon, the Eastern European breadbaskets. Those were all uh, sites of large and diverse animal migrations. So if you take the Serengeti, which is the most uh, romantic and wonderful one to talk about because of its incredible exotic array of animals, the rains begin, the grasses grow, the animals start to move to follow the grasses. They're densely compacted in their grazing practice because predators are, push, are picking off weak individuals young and old animals from the perimeter. So the, their protection is to move quickly and closely together. Um, the predators, the animals have adapted to have their babies all in one season. It's kind of confusion to the enemy. It's much harder to get a large percentage of the young when they're all on the ground at once. Plus it allows those animals to enter the migration with all their babies already born. So they set off, there are many, many kinds of them. They all graze different plants at different levels. They are, uh, as they move along, they're stamping, they're stamping bo both breaks up the soil for better water infiltration, but it also stimulates the microbial community below. And that's where the durable soil carbon comes from. As the, the animals are eating those plants, they clip off the top quickly because they're moving uh, along to keep ahead of the predators and the pests. So for instance, f uh, maggots, fly larva uh, that lodge in the animal's manure might uh, hatch three days later and the herd has already moved on. So they cut the pest pathogen that way as well. As they clip off the top quickly of these plants, it stimulates the plant to grow again because a plant is always trying to balance its biomass below the ground with its biomass above the ground. As it grows, and it, um, it may have one, two, three regrowths as the animals pass by, uh, it's harvesting carbon from the air uh, in the photosynthetic process. And it uses that carbon as a currency to trade with the microbial community below. Those are all of the nematodes and other microscopic organisms. They trade nutrients and minerals that they've mined from the soil for that carbon, which is what nourishes them. And they travel all under the soil on the mycorrhizomal highways that are created by the plant's root structure. When the plants are perennial uh, plants, they have, the, in other words, they keep growing season to season to season. Their root structure gets very long and deep and durable, and that allows those microbes to mine 
the carbon down way deep in the soil when their little bodies die and it's, they're made up of carbon as well. Um, and so that's all happening as the herd is moving along, creating that durable soil carbon and richer topsoils. Um, and they move along in the in this diversity uh, that stimulates all of the plants and all the microbes, microbes um, and also uh, allows them that sort of strength from diversification. Um, and then when the rains reverse, they go back and do it again. And they just keep going on that incredible Serengeti symphony. All right. That was pretty good for a banker. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a lot. So, um, so here I am. I'm just, you know, Joe Average. I, I, I go to the supermarket and I buy my food. So my question to you is, should I care about what's happening in other parts of the world? or even about how my food is grown. You know, I'm getting stuff from Iowa, the pork's from Iowa and, and whatever. You know, the, the blueberries are from, God knows, from South America. So uh, the tomatoes are from, from Mexico. Should I care? Does it, why does it matter to me? So as we found out, most of our, our problems are global in nature. Climate doesn't stop at, na at national borders. We're having climate events every time you turn around in this country because we've uh, allowed human activities to influence uh, climate to the point where we're right in the middle of climate change. There's no debate about it anymore. Here we are. But we can't solve climate alone. Uh, large nations like China and India, we need to inspire their leadership on climate as well. And we have to remember that we just built the biggest economy in the world based on burning fossil fuels. So now we're going to turn around and tell other countries that may not have acquired yet as high a standard of living that they shouldn't do what we just did. So there's diplomacy involved here and probably some economic risk sharing. Um, but I would say, yes, we absolutely have to worry about where our food comes from. If, you, if it's traveling long miles, it's contributing to climate change and the transportation. Uh, if it's in industrial systems, it's contributing to climate change and economic poverty by the concentrations of power and the compaction and uh, degradation of our soils. Um, we have to remember that industrial ag was actually invented in California and exported to the Midwest. So just because you're buying California food doesn't mean that you're not participating in the industrial system as well. And then to your point, we have to worry about sort of sham versions of organic where there's bare dirt farming or there's use of pesticides that somehow sneak into the regime, et cetera. Um, and we should worry about it for our own health because... Um, Food that's locally grown is better for our economic economy. Uh, our economy it has circulatory effect, and we all want to live in healthy communities that have you know a high standard of living and so on. So if we impoverish our local communities by not buying local, that's going to catch up to us as well. And of course, the health impacts of not buying healthy, nutritious food contribute to chronic lifelong disease that is not a pretty way to live, much less to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think, I, I know that, that you've been involved, you know, that Tomcat Ranch has certainly been involved in the organic movement in California. I know that you're part of EcoFarm. Um, do you think that, uh, do you think we can save the organic movement? I recognize all the problems that you've cited of, you know, um, inauthentic maintenance of standards, lack of enforcement, confusion in the consumer's mind about what actually is organic. Uh, and then also that technical adherence to organic practice can sometimes, and some of these are by some of the biggest companies in California, can actually be a, a kind of mm, less than perfect uh, realization of organic standards and the benefits that they're designed to produce. 
But I have some hope after this pandemic that people will pay more attention to the food that they're eating and they're getting um, more educated about all of the benefits of the food system potentially and the harms that it can, it can create when it's uh, operating on an industrial model. So there's like just a huge delta that the food system could provide from being one of the major contributors to climate change and economic impoverishment and lack of justice uh, to being one of the most beneficial systems we could have in terms of producing the eight or 10 or 12 co-benefits of a regenerative practice. Yeah. And just as with um, the reduction of the burning of, of fossil fuels, uh, I think you, you quoted Thomas saying that the problem is ultimately political. It's not, it's not an engineering problem. Um, and I think that's true in changing agriculture too. Is political, economic, uh, you know, there are, there are large forces that are making a great deal of money from the way things are. And um, so to change the way things are involves taking on those Goliaths, whether we go around them or we uh, go through them, I don't know. All right, let's talk about government just for a minute. Um, many people, there's this story today, yes, the government is bad, and even the government says government is bad. That's sort of the, the position. You have said, we believe in government. Government is us. Yeah. And, you know, when, when we went through this thing with the National Organic Program, we went through years of attempting to reform it. And finally, there was this showdown in, in Jacksonville, Florida, at a big meeting, and we lost. I mean, we absolutely lost at this meeting. Mm -hmm. And and I thought, well, I'm done. That's fine. I'm going to go on and do something that I do believe in. We will create an alternative to that. And that's that's what we've been working on. But as I've thought about it, I've come to realize that we need to create an alternative, but we also can't abandon government. We need government. And government is us. We are the ones paying the bill. <laughs> Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, I believe government is one of the few systems that is at least potentially accountable to us because it is us. We voted in, we fund it, et cetera. There's a big problem with the absence of campaign finance reform that there's too much money in politics. And we see that on a daily basis. And there's likely a scale problem too that we're finding out that massive bureaucracies are very hard to manage, whether it's the state of California or Chase, Chase uh, Bank. You know, the, uh, these huge organizations aren't susceptible to human management. So I believe we need to break them up and have more local accountability um, for both our corporations and our government. But we can't abandon it because it's the only way that we know of to come together and make uh, consensual, you know, collective decisions about what, what kind of world we want to live in. So I'm more interested in working hard on improving government than on dissing it or dismantling it. The, yeah. um, I was thinking of something else that, as you said, oh, you know, just recently, um, Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren have, uh, proposed a bill to reform the power concentration problem of vertically integrated agriculture. And the story of its origin is so interesting to me because obviously Cory Booker, Senator Booker, was a presidential candidate and he spent a lot of time in Iowa where he said, honestly, he didn't have great uh, reception because he's a black vegan. You know, so I'm sorry to say that probably isn't high currency in the state of Iowa. But over time, he got to know farmers and they got to know him and they had a common concern. His coming through veganism, theirs coming through uh, the power of the vertically integrated ag companies, that they were being asked to do things like, uh, you know, double shackle killing of, of chickens and all sorts of just disgusting things that they didn't want any part of, but they had no power to resist these big companies. And that was the precipitated this bill, which is an act of government. You know, it's it, things are still possible with unlikely political allies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, let's think about some thoughts about the future. 
you you, you just gave a, a story of hope. Mm-hmm. How, how are you feeling? I I mean, you know, I know that I know you're fighting the good fight. All right, we're all in the Rebel Alliance, and we know that we're up against you know pretty massive forces. Do you feel that that change is is possible in our lifetime? I do. I have place a lot of hope in the in the coming generations, millennials to Gen Zers, um, because I think the the they pulled the wool off of their eyes. They actually get a lot of these systemic failures. Um, and they're so um, social media savvy that I, I was interviewing some young people who started something called the Black Resilience Fund in Portland, just a magnificent effort. They've raised over $2 million now, I think, to give grant, to give money, $13 to $300 to Black Portlanders who have been harmed by the system and for whom that represents uh, you know, a recovery of their resilience. And the whole thing is volunteer-led uh, and run. It's all volunteers engaged in mutual aid, and they have some of the most sophisticated systems of organization I've ever experienced in my life. So I have great faith that this these coming generations know how to organize, and it is organizing power that's going to change government and change the rules and hold the corporations to account and um, empower consumers and everything else that we need at this time. All right. Thank you so much, Kat Taylor. That's a, that, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to beat that. That's a beautiful place to end. So <laughs> yes. and hopeful. thank you for talking and yeah. hopeful. That's right. Thank we you, we got, got to have that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope you will subscribe to our podcast, tell your friends about it, and leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you found us. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to today's conversation, can be found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 16. Please join us next time for an interview with real organic blueberry farmer Hugh Kent of Kingrove Organic Farm in Florida. He talks about the very real struggle of competing with and losing market share to hydroponic berry growers who simply can't produce a berry that tastes anything like his soil-grown berries. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms.